increasingly thinkless world. The autocorrect changed it to thankless, and I'm like, well, that wasn't very nice of you. The autocorrect tried to be uh, <laughs> the, the the autocorrect tried to be uh, discerning, and it failed. Let me read a couple of statistics to you this morning. 94% of all Americans read the news for at least 10 minutes a day. 94%. 18% of all Americans have checked for sources with their news. Talk about a gap, right? 40% of all Americans suspect having been deceived by the news. And 100% of these statistics were made up and have no source whatsoever. 100%. No, right, right. None of them were true. They were completely false. Listen to this quote. Of all the elements of man's treachery and villainy, the only one that is welcomed and cherished is falsehood. I'm going to read that again. Of all the elements of man's treachery and villainy, the only one that is welcomed and cherished is falsehood. You want to know who said that? No one. I made it up. <laughs> all right. No one. It's a fake quote. How about this one? Whoops. Whoa, 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 whoa. Um, the image on the screen shows Greenland in a typical, oh, I forgot what the name of it was. Ah, it's not Mercator. It's not Azimuthal. There's like four different big world map views. It's the one where you flatten it out, but it's not flattened out like an orange peel. It's flattened out like a rectangle, right? And, of course, Europe is right in the center because they made the maps and they can decide who's at the middle. Um, and uh, so if you look at the top of your screen, you'll see a massive chunk of land called Greenland. You ever seen that on your map before? That looks about right, doesn't it? Yeah. No, but it, but it is going to be this way on almost every map you see. I didn't make this map up. This is a regular map. In fact... Um, a very similar one to this was posted on Washington Post. This is a common map used to represent the world. It just looks a little different because Greenland is in green. But if you ever watched the Mighty Ducks, you'll know that Greenland is full of ice and Iceland is full of green. That's just a good way to remember those. Anyways, um, how big is Greenland actually? It's pretty small. It fits inside Algeria, one country in the continent of Africa. You'll notice about one-eighth the size of how it's actually represented on a map. On a map, it looks like it could overtake, completely swallow the United States and Canada together. Almost the entire American continent, if you include Mexico. But in reality, Greenland is actually very small, comparatively. Does that make sense so far? All right, now I'm done. Yes, Adam. You know, the, story, the, the old story goes like this. The Vikings went to Greenland, but the church people went to Greenland. They... They didn't actually, they wanted, they went to Iceland, but they wanted people not to go to Iceland, so they wanted them to go to Greenland, so they called it Greenland. Oh, no kidding. Yeah. <laughs> How about that? Well, the new story is everybody wants, to, the Greenland people want you to come to their country and think there's a lot of land to settle and populate, but there's not. Um, it's about the size of Algeria. Algeria. Um, you say, well, how big is Algeria? Oh, shucks. I don't know. I suppose I'd have to look at it on my on my map. Yeah, I'm trying to compare. I would say it's about as big as from Texas to Nebraska, the bottom of Texas to Nebraska. And then about that wide, too, if you had to kind of. But certainly it's nowhere near as large as it looks on the previous map, which, like I say, it looks like it could completely engulf. And so growing up, I looked at this map of Greenland and I'm like, yeah, Greenland's huge, man. It's huge. But Greenland sits at, at the top of the globe. And there's no way to kind of flatten out that map while preserving the actual size and scale of these countries. Now, I know my children's realities are completely shattered. They're like, Father, we were going to settle Greenland and make it our own. Well, we'll have to settle for a different country because it's not going to happen. All right. Just so you can let your guard down, I'm done with the fake quotes and statistics. Here's a real one by S. Michael Craven. He says the following. What the world needs, perhaps more now than ever, are men and women who are equipped in the ancient virtue of wisdom. Wisdom is the ability to discern what is true and good and beautiful. Wisdom is the ability to discern what is true and good and beautiful. That quote is fake. No, it's not. It really isn't. It isn't. It's actually a fellow who works for um, the Colson Center. Um, yeah, brilliant, brilliant, brilliant group. How about this one? 
from your from your Bibles, Proverbs chapter four, verse seven. Wisdom is the principal thing. What's the conclusion? Therefore, get wisdom. Well, how do I get wisdom? Well, we could we could go into the more spiritual aspects of wisdom. We talk about the fear of the Lord at the beginning of wisdom. We talk about if any man lack wisdom, let him ask of God. He gives to all men liberally. I, I am speaking of a less theologically inclined wisdom and more of a general wisdom that would have been proper in the Proverbs, uh, such as raise your kid in, in the ways of the Lord. When he's old, he won't depart from it. These are general axiomatic statements. In other words, these are generally true things. Don't spit into the wind, all right? Basic truth. Well, I spat into the wind, and I was fine. Okay, but normally you're not. (laughs) You know what I'm saying? My kids, Dad, can I spit out the window, kid? Yes, actually. Let's see how that turns out for you when we're in the van, not the house, when we're in the van. We're driving down 60 miles an hour. I want to spit out the window. Aerodynamics (laughs) brings that right back into the back seat. (laughs) <laughs> the two littles who sit in the back um, would not appreciate that gift. <laughs> wisdom. Wisdom teaches you don't spit out a van window while you're going 60 miles an hour. And there's two ways to learn that. Experience and precept. You following me? Experience says, did it? Don't want to do that ever again. Guy, this is a little gross, but I got to wake you up. I was riding with my cousin, Anthony. I don't have any real cousins, but they were my parents' best friends growing up. And I had just gotten my first car, a 2003 Ford Mustang convertible, leather interior. I had an inheritance from my grandfather. Yes, I wasted it like the prodigal son. Get over it. All right, here we go. I'm telling that to myself. I have to get over it every single day. If I just invested that in Bitcoin. Oh, anyways, (sighs) missed opportunities. But then I wouldn't be here. So you're stuck with me. Um. Driving in this 2003 Ford Mustang convertible, and uh, it was right after my freshman year of college. I had come back, and that was actually when I got my first and only speeding ticket. Um, That's the story for another day. It's hard not to when you're in a brand new Mustang convertible, guys, and it's summertime. But my cousin Anthony thought it would be a tremendously wonderful idea to get rid of whatever was occupying the contents of his throat or his throat. And shot it out the window on his side, it didn't go anywhere. It landed right on my side mirror. And when I say it, I'm talking about like a life form, guys. This, this one was for the science books, okay? Now, I know that's really gross. I know. You're like, how are we supposed to eat candy this morning after that? I don't know. It's the new diet plan, I guess. But, and I'm thinking, geez, so... Did he ever do that again? No, not in my car, he didn't. I, from experience. Now, if you say, well, I, I've got a buddy of mine riding in my car. Now you know ahead of time. If you feel, if you feel like expectorating in any way, don't. That's precept. What's that? And don't wait. What's that one? Off of the old. And don't mess around with Jim. Oh, okay. That's a new one to me. Oh. Don't spit into the wind. Oh, okay, okay, okay. Now I understand. So, so, the, so the, the millennial aspect of me, I have enough boomer in me to qualify me for my fellow Gen Xs and things, but the millennial part of me just hasn't heard that, and I am truly sorry. If it helps, I can sing the platters and the penguins up here for you to make up for it. I can. <laughs> Oh, wow. Harsh, harsh. You need to be more discerning, okay? No, that was discerning. You say, Pastor, we, we, now. Right. So, Ralph's mean to me. Right. So, get wisdom, the Bible says. Get wisdom. And again, I believe that the Bible um, has wisdom that kind of, if you can picture in your mind an amoeba, I guess it sounds a little silly, but picture in your mind an amoeba, and that wisdom extends into different areas of life. And when we talk about spiritual wisdom, the wisdom of fearing the Lord definitely has to do with general wisdom. Okay, it definitely does. But just in general, when you're reading a news article or listening to a story from a friend or hearing about whatever conspiracy theory, and some of them aren't actually conspiracy theories, they just tell you that so that you're, you know, whatever, right? So so that you don't think you're onto something, I don't know. But whatever it is, um, 
wisdom is important or discernment is important. Wisdom and discernment is pretty much the same thing in this case. I was reading a Facebook post by a young man that I actually used to teach. Uh, he was in my youth choir and just a good boy, a very, very good boy. Went to my alma mater, graduated, and came out just like I did. So hopefully there's hope for him if there's hope for me. And um, just your typical, and again, the guy's an amazing kid, but it's your typical um, young man who graduates from Bible college, and now he's going to set the world at rights. You know what I mean? Um, that's not a slam or anything. I was the exact same way. Kevin was worse. And uh, wait, what? <laughs> He's actually nodding. <laughs> so, no, but like, that's just the way it is, okay? Ray was never like that, actually. He was actually more humble when he was done with Bible college. He'd, look at this. He's nodding, too. Apparently, I'm hitting, I'm getting 100s right now. This is the only quiz I've ever aced. But, uh, and Adam, yeah, Adam's like, wait for me, big guy. No, Adam, Adam was ready to burn the world down and restart a new one in his image. <laughs> sure. And so, but uh, anyway, so. So this young man posted this thing, and again, it's very, it's generally true, and he says something like, you know, when when pastors leave the Word of God and and pursue new devices, you know, um, it shows that they're they're discontent with Christ, you know. And again, that's generally true. But knowing me, I'm reading it and I'm analyzing it, and I'm saying, what what is he actually trying to say? Let let me share something with you, and this is this is going to come into play here in the next point. But sometimes it's really important to ask people to ask yourself. Or ask the person who said it without actually asking them. You're asking a straw man of them. What are you trying to say with what you've said? Now, you say, that sounds very suspicious. I think it can be taken to an unhealthy extreme where we overanalyze everything, right? Hey, honey, you look great today. Oh, today? Does that mean yesterday I didn't? <laughs> no! into the black hole we go. Now, my wife is not like that, thankfully. Um, I'm, I'm that way. I'm that way. And uh, <laughs> pastor, that was the best sermon I've ever heard you preach. Oh, I've only been here for eight years, jerk. <laughs> what about those sermons? You know what I'm saying? It's terrible. I'm awful, right? Anyways, so it can be taken to an unhealthy extreme, but I think in general, the scriptures and life in general, which should never be separate, by the way, the scriptures, oh, this is a big one for me. This is a 30-second detour. You guys ready? Here we go. The scriptures were never intended to separate the sacred from the secular. All right, here's real life, and then here's Bible life. No, no, no. No, Christianity is not just a formula that you apply to your life. It's living out the story of Jesus in your own life. It's, it's something that flows through you, not something you stick on you like Velcro. Okay? Anyway, that was even less than 30 seconds. May God bless you. Yeah. Yeah. Mine mattered more. I said it last. I think that's the rule, right? Whoever said it last? Anyway. So my wife actually got me onto that. That's a great example of discernment. Um, wisdom, I should say. Is I'm like, I'm not saying God bless you after they sneeze. Why would I carry on a meaningless, empty pagan tradition? And my wife's like, because it's nice to do. <laughs> Or whatever you said. It was something you were just like, it's common courtesy or something like that, right? It shows care for them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that was, that was like, Bedtime story, that, sure. That, yeah, that yeah. So, so for me, for me, uh, I'm thinking this is a baseless pagan tradition, expelling demons when someone sneezes. Foolishness. I won't raise my children in this paradigm. And there's my wife. May God bless you and may the demons leave you. <laughs> she doesn't go that far. But like for me, for me, I'm just like, it's, I don't want to do it. It's, I don't want to, I don't want to perpetuate that. And then my wife is like, it's just the way in our culture that we show that we care. And then of course it goes deeper. I'm like, babe, why should we have to show that we care when someone sneezed? Do we have to do that when they cough? When they pass gas? I mean, I'm, I'm just saying like, what, what is, what's the rule, right? What's the rule, Kevin? Okay, so then I'll say, by the fact that you're still standing here and not stroking out, you made it. All right, my, my, my thing is now going to be like, glad you made it. Glad you made it through. <laughs> Whenever someone sneezes, hey, I'm glad you pulled through. <laughs> I'm glad you're still with us. That's my new thing. <laughs> Cheryl? I would just pull the uh, away from the I, You're right. That's a good point. Um, you know... Kim's dad, Colonel Hammond, 
and my mother used to be on a lot of town committees. Sure. And my mother always talked about how people would come in and they'd have these charts and graphs and everybody get looking at them and they get sucked into the idea. Hmm. And Colonel would just sit back and listen and, you know, because he couldn't see the charts and he wouldn't get pulled in. And he had a lot of wisdom, too, because he's like him. He really knew the Bible. Sure. I think that people that study the Bible tend to have a lot of wisdom because there's so much there. to feel. That's, that's a huge point. Really, it is. And that's where I think that those two worlds come together. Right. It's people who do spend time in timeless wisdom have the wisdom to see past a lot of the new trends that come up. Now, not every new development is a trend, right? We learned that a feather in a vacuum chamber falls exactly as fast as the bowling ball. That's a new thing. That doesn't mean it's bad. It's new, right? It's a new development. But wisdom can see um, uh, things that are not measurable by test tubes and beakers and things like that and can distill appropriately or discernment. So, yes, I think that appropriately closes the loop. So, moving on. If wisdom is the thing we want to get, how do we apply it? In other words, when we're reading a Facebook post by a friend or listening to, here's my second example of two, listening to a sermon where the guy, I think it's C.T. Studd, if you don't know him, don't waste your time. Um, and I'm, I, I shouldn't, I'm not saying he's a bad guy. I'm just saying it's just your typical, don't, Kevin, I'm sorry. It's, is this Studd, is that the guy who's still alive? No, C.T. Studd, oh, C.T. Townsend, which I did not just say. All right, anyway, so it's this young preacher. He's the one with the big tent revivals for a year and all of that, and now he's wearing million-dollar suits, million-dollar building and everything. It worked out real well for him. And uh, so he's preaching this clip, and this clip has been shared, and I saw a couple of my friends share it. And it's just your typical, and I say typical because it's not doesn't mean it's wrong, but it's just your very basic, like, hey, you know, God wants what's best for you, God wants what— and when you see something like that and you see like 60 million people like sharing it and loving it, it's okay to say, is this true? Just because everybody loves a certain particular person or passage being used in this way, it is okay. Nay, it is good to stop before you share, so to speak, so to speak. Stop before you assimilate that as truth into your mind. Slow down and say, okay, is this true? Why is the clip being shared? Why is it affecting so many people? What was the pastor saying? Is the, does the pastor have any support for this outside of one verse that's used this way a lot of times incorrectly? You know what I'm saying? How about a pastor, and this is not what this particular pastor was saying, I don't think, I don't remember what he was saying, but uh, a pastor who gets up there and says, I know the plans that I have for you to prosper you and to create a great nation from you. You know what I'm saying? That's a verse said by Yahweh to the Jews during a really hard time in their life, that doesn't mean it's for you. In fact, Jesus very specifically said, if you follow me, you're going to have persecution. It's going to be rough. It's going to be tough. And here we are clinging to a promise that doesn't apply to us because we weren't discerning. We weren't discerning. So be discerning. Now, when you, and here's, here's my five-step program. You ready for a five-step program? <laughs> $19.99 plus tax. Shipping and handling not included. Kids, have your parents' permission before you call. Step one, read carefully. No joke. Read carefully. Here's a fellow of mine. He's actually a dear, he really is a dear friend. I, I love him to death. We graduated together because I crammed five years into or four years into five, and uh, he did not. So we graduated together. Right. Uh, he, he's a sweet young man. He is. He's very zealous. And uh, sometimes I'll post things, and he'll post a comment that's very insightful, very thoughtful, and has some good pushback. He never posts anything in agreement, only pushback. And I guess that's fine. I need that in my life. I really do. Otherwise, I can just get carried away, thinking I'm right all the time. You don't want that, right? So we like pushback. But, like, all of his pushback shows he didn't really read what I posted. Mm -hmm. Like, if he would just slow down and read it again, he would see that I said... Almost all instead of all. Or, in my experience, this instead of this is always. Does that make sense? When I post things, and not everybody's like this, so I understand, but when I post things, I am, unless if it's a silly post about cats or cereal or something silly, but when I post things, I'm very careful about how I say things. And you would not believe how many drafts go into like what appears to be a 30-second post. Because I'm so careful to immunize myself, to make myself bulletproof against misunderstandings. Make sense so far? So I feel like if somebody just read carefully, they would save a lot of time and effort and brain power on their part and say, oh, yeah, he already covered this. Now, 
How else did this apply? Read carefully. You're reading something in the news or you're reading something um, on a Facebook post. I say Facebook post a lot because that's how a lot of news gets around. Twitter, Facebook, Instagram. That is what drives our world, guys. Right. Seriously, that's what drives our world. If any major company gets rid of their social media accounts, they would lose, depending on how big they are, a substantial fraction of their income. Yep. TV commercials are not nearly as effective a social media post, truly. In fact, TV commercials are now beginning to mimic social media posts. Where Amber and I are watching a program like on Paramount or something, right? And a commercial comes on and it says, click for more, and it'll take you to the actual website on your television. Like they're becoming more interactive because social media is much more effective than television commercials. So if it's a commercial, read carefully. Not every commercial is, is mandated by law to include the side effects. Don't you love the commercial, the people running happily in the park because they got the psoriasis medicine, but then the guy in the background are going, headaches may include vomiting, diarrhea, headache, coma, and even death. And you're like, whoa, all this for clear skin? No thanks. You know what I'm saying, right? And I told my wife, I'm like, the cancer ones I get, you know, the whatever, but like, you know, I have a little bit of psoriasis. My mom has dealt with psoriasis her whole life extremely, but... Death versus psoriasis. I'm going to go ahead and, you know what I'm saying? I, I get it. Yes, I think. Yeah, yeah, especially, right? So, but here's the thing. In real life, people don't actually do that, right? Read things carefully. Everything. But my doctor said this was fine. You're, you know, he, <laughs> there's that. Do you know that, um, in my school, homeschool, ACE, Accelerated Christian Education, School of Tomorrow, I like ACE. You had to get an 80 to pass your test. That's actually pretty high. Isn't it in public school like 65 or 70 right now? Yes. Can you imagine missing almost half of every question and still graduating? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Amber's like, been there, done that. No, okay. But like now you say, well, the, the requirements are much more stringent with other establishment. Sure, and I hope they are. When I took my food safety course, if you got, if you only missed, you were allowed to miss two and get a $100 bonus, which was a lot for fast food, especially in these days, from your franchise owner because of that extremely stellar performance. Yes, I walked away with $100. Anyway, so it was stellar. I was just, I was the bell of the bull, right? I was, I was the big one. And I'm thinking, I missed a question. What if that question that I missed kills somebody? This is food safety. You're congratulating me? I missed one. I'm just, guys, I'm not being an overachiever. I'm talking people's life. And then when I worked at the, I'm, I'm, I'm setting you up for something. I'm not wasting your time. I'm not rambling. And then when I worked um, at, at Goodwill, you you had such stringent policies. Goodwill, oh, it's a, it was, I was a CRMA. I gave medicine to people, right? You're allowed to mess up a couple times before they fire you. And again, I understand nobody's perfect. I understand that. But like, you can kill somebody. Well, that's strike one. <laughs> what? I mean, seriously, you can mismedicate. Let's see, I, guys, and, and now here's the thing. You say, what and all, what is all that for? I'm bringing it back. I'm trying to close the loop on this whole thing. Well, my doctor said it was fine. And no, this isn't a vaccine thing. I, I didn't even have that in mind until a second ago. But like, whatever it is, read everything. Read about it. Read around it. Read, you know, every preposition you can think of, study. And somebody's like, yes, I did my own research. I found a YouTube video where the guy, that does not count as research. Wikipedia and YouTube are not allowed. You can't call them research. All right, moving right along. Read carefully. What's that? Yeah, TikTok's even better. TikTok, that's the number of seconds you have to live after you've consulted them for medical advice. <laughs> You know it's bad when I'm laughing at my own joke. I don't know why I've been here so long to, to get it. You're only encouraged. It's so bad. Why took me long to get it? And I was like, oh. oh. <laughs> All right. Here we go. Let's keep moving on. Oh, man. All right. Read carefully. Number two. 
analyze thoughtfully. So you've read it. And again, I kind of bled number two into number one. But number one, read carefully what you're reading, whether it's a scripture text. And again, let's really, let's really tie this to Bible reading, right? Somebody says, yeah, I read this verse in my personal devotions, and this is what God said to me. Is it? I'm, I'm just being, I'm just, you know what I mean? Is it? Read carefully. What does it say? What does it not say? What does it not say? And then, and then consider, excuse me, analyze thoughtfully. Don't just go, and for God, for God's whole the world, the given the begotten Son who was believed in Him. Yep, I read it. That doesn't count as reading. Are, are you with me? You can't, just, you can't just have the words uploaded into your mind and say, yep, I read it. Read carefully. Step one, read carefully doesn't even come into play unless if you've analyzed thoughtfully. What did the words say? What did the words mean? How were the words used? Do you know that there are so many different words? Um, how about this? Um, what is it? Let's use the word race. What does the word race mean? Like somebody's running a race, right? Or somebody might use it to the color of the skin, right? Or not a competition. Somebody just racing for the for the kitchen because they heard the, the can opener. Apparently we're talking about cats now. You know what I mean? <laughs> I but you know what I'm saying? Like there's different uses of the same word. So context is everything. And it never is more applicable than when you read the Bible because you can't just read it with today's context. You've got to read it with ancient Near East contexts. You say, that sounds like a lot of work. Welcome to Bible study. In the words of the late Michael Heiser, Bible study is not for sissies. It's not. You say, that sounds like too much for me. Then read, don't read anything. Watch Home Alone. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> I'm just saying. If it's too much work to read carefully and analyze thoughtfully, if you say, I'm not willing to invest that much, then don't. Then, then at least be honest and say, I am choosing to be blissfully ignorant and watch Kevin McAllister run around getting lost or, you know, however many movies they'll make. Why are you picking on Home Alone? I don't know. It's brainless and I love it. Ask me later. I'll tell you my favorite scene from the movie. All right. Step two is analyze thoughtfully. Step three, consider critically. Oh, I was taught never to be critical. Well, then unlearn that. Criticize. Well, doesn't criticize mean to tear somebody down? Nope. Everything in context. The word to criticize simply means, it, it essentially means to scrutinize and to pick apart. In, in today's language, you're picking something apart. You're examining it critically. A pinpoint. What's that, Kim? Like critique. critique. Exactly right. Now, uh, Jordan Peterson, and I, I know this is church, and Jordan Peterson is not a Christian, I understand that. But Jordan Peterson said this, and it stuck with me. He said, I want you to think of one thing you wish was different about yourself, a bad habit you have, or something you wish you could change that actually is in your control. He says, think about it. So church, think about it, just for a second. Now he says, think of what it would take to actually change that. Was it easy? No. But that's what must be done. And that's why a lot of people don't change bad habits, because it's simply not easy. Are you with me so far? It's not easy. It's not easy. But what that process is, is criticizing self or thinking critically or critiquing self. We must think critically. We have a responsibility to think critically. Just accepting everything that comes down the pipeline, just saying, oh, man, that sounds real good. If you believed everything you heard, you would have 16 different beliefs about every single thing in the world. Are you with me? And that means at least 15 of them will be false, probably 16. Guys, I'll be very transparent when I tell you that the position in which I am standing right now has been guilty of discouraging critical thinking for the last several hundred years, especially in the West. Standing behind a pulpit and saying, you know what, that's really complicated. Just trust me, I'm your pastor. Um, if I can't tell you to go critically examine everything I say, then I'm probably lying to you. I'm pulling the wool over your eyes. Now, here's the tricky part. I'm going to be very, I'm going to be very transparent on the other side, too. Some people go, that's right, I'm going to examine everything my pastor says. And then they take it, and they go to, like, their three favorite preachers from, you know, their radio program or the old preacher who they love and know and trust, who's only going to tell them exactly what they want to hear because it's what they already believe. Are you with me? This is the first Sunday I've ever worn flip-flops to church. Guys, it's hot. It's sweaty. Nobody wants that. I don't. That's what's important. No. It could be very possible that somebody would go, well, my pastor said it's a sin to wear flip-flops to church. 
Okay, well, you read it carefully. It's not that big of a sentence. You've considered it thoughtfully. You understood what he meant, that it misses the mark of God's good world to wear flip off to church. But now I want you to consider that critically. Is there any truth to that at all? Well, sure. No, it's not. There's no truth. If you can show me where there's truth, see, what I'm doing, I'm, criti- I'm picking it apart. Truth can withstand criticism. Truth does. In fact, it's the only thing that does. Philippians chapter 4, verse 8, whatsoever things are true, honest, just, pure, lovely, good report, virtuous, praiseworthy, think on these things. This is why, and this, oh, Michael, he's gone off the deep end. Whatever you want to call it, Michael has gone off the deep end because Michael, just like many of you, have gotten a little bit fed up with not being allowed to criticize some of the things I heard and learned growing up. I just had to accept it. And then when you start to actually look into it and criticize it and you go, man, there's a lot here. This is, this is going to be a bonus. You know what I was doing all this morning from like the time I woke up to like an hour before church? I was studying the history of circumcision. You say, Britt, you got a boring life and a little bit weird. I don't deny either one of those charges. I wanted to learn more about it. I was always told growing up that God made circumcision. He made it up. It's not true. It was, a, it was an ancient Near East practice, practice long before the Israelites ever did it. So what that's going to do is that's either going to put a dent in my faith because I had heard, well, God made this up. God instituted this, and he's the first one who did it. And if my faith rests on that, as soon as I learn by critically examining that claim, as soon as I learn that God didn't make it up, it wasn't like a brand new thing, my faith is going to hurt. But if I'm taught growing up, yes, this was a common ancient Near East practice, this was adopted into the Jewish religion for this reason, then I can go, oh yeah, that makes sense. Because the Bible actually never claims that God made it up out of the blue. You see what I'm saying? So when you hear all of these, these, oh boy, you know, I, I, don't, I don't know, what I'm just trying to pick one out of a hat. All of these crazy, foolish things from the Bible and you build your faith on them, the minute you learn they're not true, your faith implodes like a soda can in a, in a crusher. Because it was based on things that, that are not true. So we have a responsibility as early in life in po- as possible so that our faith doesn't come down hard. As early in life as possible to consider claims critically. You went to church and heard this? Good. If it was true, it'll hold up to criticism. Stop being afraid to criticize, to hold it under the light. Shine, you know the interrogation light like in all those cool crime dramas? Or Brooklyn Nine-Nine, whichever one you like. <clears throat> right? Shining the light right on them. Truth can hold up to that. In fact, that's where truth flourishes. Because truth is a stubborn thing. And when everything else fades away, truth won't move. And truth and time are best friends. You've heard me say that before. Truth and time are best friends. They're like, they're like what's that, Kim? It does make the darkness go away. Yeah, I love that. Truth and time. Hold in hand. They're like an old married couple. Like an old married couple, you may not always see him at the same place all the time. You know what I'm saying? He's, he's going out golfing and she's going out shopping. At the end of the day, though, they're still sleeping in the same bed. Unless you're talking, you know, a, a, I dream of genie or whatever, when everybody still had two beds. I don't know what it was. But, like, it wasn't that show. I was just thinking of nice old shows. I love, Lucy. I love Lucy. Yeah, I dream of Lucy. I dream of genie. What I, I anyway, so. <laughs> I love genie. All right. So, consider critically. What's that? I do love Amber. I call her genius a nickname. So anyways. <laughs> On to the next point. All right, here we go. Step four. <laughs> Step four. Accept tentatively. Accept tentatively. Um, I, I've likened it this way. You've read or heard what somebody said carefully. You haven't just heard bits and pieces. And I'm going to run with that. That's nonsense. Don't do that. You owe it to yourself to read something more than once or to listen to something more than once, to understand everything they're saying. Thoughtfully engage with what you've read or heard. Criticize. Pick it apart. Is this true? Is it true? If it's not true, it's not deserving of your attention. Certainly not deserving of your allegiance. The fourth step out of five is simply this. Accept tentatively. I've likened it to this. Your mind is like a harbor for ships. Like a harbor for ships. You've got ships coming in and out all the time. New thoughts, new ideas. You know, what, you know what a good customs agent does? He doesn't just go, you're not welcome here because you're new and I've never heard of you before. That ship could have treasure. Are you with me so far? You don't just turn it away because it looks funny. You don't just turn it away because you were told by everybody else that it's bad. You take a look yourself. 
Now, I'm not saying that in the multitude of counselors, there's not wisdom. If other people are saying, we've had that ship in our harbor, you want to be careful about this. But nobody should ever say, don't check it out yourself. I think, I think we should all be very careful to say, here's been my experience with it. I will hold your hand as we go through that ship together and look through the contents. Are you with me? But we don't say, don't look in that ship. People need to see for themselves. So the ship comes in the harbor, this new idea, this thought. A good customs agent doesn't go, you're not here. But also a good customs agent doesn't just go, yeah, you're clear to go. Head right on in, unload everything. That's also bad. Are you with me? Except tentatively. Say, okay, you're new. I don't know you. I've got a lot of ships that I've had in my harbor for 20 years, 30 years, 40 years, 50 years. And maybe this new ship that comes in means another one has to go. Follow me here. And you say, this is weird. It's, it's a little scary. But you have a responsibility to the truth and to yourself to say, I'm at least going to check this out. And I'm going to check it out with wisdom. I'm going to check it out with criticism. I'm not going to be like, oh, man, I've heard this ship is great. And then just don't even bother to look through the content. Just go by what you've heard. You know what I'm saying? You've got to exercise caution, but you have to check it out. You can't say, come on in, and you can't say, head on out. That is not what a good customs agent will do. Can you imagine heading to a foreign country for a visit? Purpose of your visit? Never mind, I don't care. Get back on the plane. What? Right? Or purpose of your visit? Never mind, I don't care. Head on in, you look fine. You know what I'm saying? Nobody would accept that in any other form of life. So why would we allow it with our minds? And then lastly... This is where I struggle the most. Really, Pastor? Yes. I am so, so critical. And I accept things so tentatively that it's very hard for me to settle and believe on something fully. I know that doesn't shock anyone in here. Nobody's gasping for air or clutching their pearls. <laughs> I can see Ray, you know, clutching his pro. Yeah. But C.S. Lewis said this um, of denominations, interestingly enough. He said, mere Christianity, believing in Jesus, believing in the resurrection, as a bare minimum, right? It's like the foyer of a big house. And the different denominations are like rooms. He goes, you can't live in the foyer. You have to find a room. Now, I don't like that. I'm a foyer kind of guy. I like foyers so much, I know all the names for them. Vestibules, narthex. I could go on. I couldn't. There's not that many more. All right. So, but I'm just saying, stoia is the Greek one. All right. So, I like foyers. Or foyer, if you're fancy. I really don't like settling down somewhere because I've done it before and I've been hurt by it and I settled down in the wrong place. So, I'm really, really hesitant to say, this is what I believe. There are some things in life of which I am absolutely sure, because you know me, I can see it in front of my face. But how many times, there's probably at least a couple, how many times have you really seen something in front of your face that it turned out you still weren't seeing exactly what you thought you were seeing? <sighs> Excuse me while I go rock in a corner, you know? But at some point, you can't rush this process, but you can't delay it forever either. After you've done your homework, after you've said, okay, this looks good, this looks good, you've got to take what one philosopher with a Dutch name that I, could, I never will be able to pronounce it correctly calls the shortest leap. What, what step of faith is the shortest one? You guys know my story. One of the biggest turning points for me is when I decided, just like you have to decide if you haven't already, what the shortest leap of faith is for the creation of this whole thing we call the universe. That it exploded out of nothing, from nothing, and then chaos created order, sensibility, life, emotions, and right? I don't care how many lightning strikes you have and how many random RNA strands you have in the primordial pool. That still is a greater leap for me than to say, I don't understand exactly how it worked, but there's definitely a mind behind all this. You know what I'm saying? That's just one example of the different short leaps and if you if you let the ship come into the harbor and you've examined the goods, you, you can't tell the ship, all right, stay here for 20 years, and I'm going to decide on this eventually. I'm not saying to rush it. Don't rush it. But I am saying you can't live there forever. And you guys know I'm preaching to myself here about these little tiny things, these little tiny things.
For me, one of the big issues is going to come as a surprise to you because I don't really play my cards. You know, I don't lay my cards out all on a table at once. But one of the things that I've examined very closely over the last year is complementarianism versus egalitarianism. You say, bless you, preacher. I have no idea what that means. I know. It's the belief that um, only men can pastor a church versus men and women can pastor a church. In other words, why can't a woman pastor a church? Is it just some backwards patriarchal thinking from the first century? Or is that a timeless command of God? Now, I've always heard one way, and one way has always made sense to me, but I owe it to myself and the truth to investigate. And to investigate with as open of a mind as I can and say, what do the scriptures say? How, how does this make sense? How does this play out? And in so doing, I learned there's actually some pretty good arguments for egalitarianism. None, however, that persuaded me to abandon what I believe is God's model for humanity. But you know what it does? It gives me a sympathy and an empathy, not a sympathy, excuse me, an empathy and a relationship with people who don't believe the way I do. Because I can see where they're coming from a little bit better, a lot better. Does that make sense? And by the way, I think that'll really help you as you learn to think with discernment. Last slide. Excuse me, second to last slide. Your mind is a battleground. Why would you not be on guard? You say, oh, that's cute. That's a nice little aphorism. But please think about it. Really, if wisdom is the principal thing, and I think you believe that, if wisdom is the most important thing because it drives everything else in your life, why would you guard your car, motorcycle, he doesn't guard his motorcycle. I guard it. I watch it. I don't sleep. I stare out the window at it. <laughs> still can. Your Pokemon card collection? Josh? Josh. Yeah. No. <laughs> He's like, you can't deflect that on me. <laughs> no, but like, why would, you, why would you guard anything else more than your mind? Um, politics is very important to me. It is. Um, I, I have hobbies that are important to me. My family is of the absolute utmost importance to me. But I can't do any of those things right if I don't have my mind. I didn't say my brain, guys. Hopefully I'll have that to my dying day, you know what I mean? But my mind. Ideas are coming in and out all the time. This is why, guys, listen, this is why I tell you, every, it seems like I tell you every week. Now, let me phrase it this way. This is why I said last week that Disney has more governing power. May God bless you. That This is why I said last week that Disney has more governing power than the government. Why? Because Disney is putting ideas out there, not the government. The government's receiving ideas and then matching those ideas with this other ideas. You know what I'm saying? And this isn't hate on Disney Day. I like Boba Fett as much as the rest of them. Well, technically the Mandalorian, but, you know, we'll get there later. Anyway, um, but the idea is that there, there really are very few. I'm not going to say there's no. That's a, that's a, I think that's an unfounded statement. But there are very few neutral ideas out there. Very few. And we have a responsibility to ourselves and to the truth to discern. Your mind is a battleground. Why would you not be on guard? In fact, uh, William Lane Craig, noted philosopher, Christian, has a book called On Guard. And it's a very good approach to apologetics in a practical sense. All right, last slide. How much better to get wisdom than gold? Um, I saw this clip. Uh, one of our foremen, our electrician foreman, shared this clip, and I thought, that's pretty cool. I, I Obviously, I analyzed it. I criticized it. I found some parts that weren't quite as realistic. But in general, I think it holds up. Listen to this. There's this fella, and he's talking to people, and he says, if I were to give you $20 million today, would you feel happy? Yes. I mean, but let's not, well, actually, I feel, stop this. You'd be happy, okay? <laughs> yeah, right, yes, yes. For that day, for that one day, almost nothing could bring you down, right? You'd be on cloud nine. Now, if I told you, um, I'm going to give you $20 million today, but you can't wake up tomorrow morning. Today's your last day. Would you take it? With very rare exception, no. With rare exception, I understand there's, I understand there's grief, I understand there's mental disorder, I understand, but very, with very rare exception, no. So then this guy comes to the conclusion, wait a minute, you just told me that your life is more valuable to you than $20 million, right? Yes. You also said that if I gave you $20 million, 
nothing could bring you down for that day. Are you with me so far? And then he makes the link. You have life every single day. And yet we walk around grumpy, complaining, and sad, but you just said that your life is even more valuable to you than $20,000. Now, again, we could break it down, and I, and I have. We say, okay, well, that doesn't quite line. But just in general, in general. So I'm going to liken that parable of sorts to this. If I were to say, I'm going to give you a pallet full of gold, close to $20 million, <laughs> right? I'm going to give you a pallet full of gold, um, or you can have wisdom for the rest of your life. We all know what Solomon chose, right? I, I would say without wisdom, I wouldn't even know what to do with the gold. I'd probably, I, I don't know, I just thought of 10 things and none of them were like, <laughs> made sense. So <laughs> clearly I don't, you know. But with wisdom, I would, with wisdom, I would know what to do with what little gold I have. So I would say, well, I would choose wisdom rather than gold. Okay. But look at what our life's pursuits actually reflect that we value. You know? How about this? I could give you wisdom or I could give you uh, TV shows. I could give you wisdom or I could give you this. I could give you... I think most of us, in a solemn, ready state of mind, we'd say, I'll take wisdom. But our life's pursuits don't always reflect that wisdom really is the principal thing. So, my challenge to you this morning... And I said it in the title. My challenge to you this morning, I'm going to go back to my title page. How to think critically in an increasingly thinkless world. To be discerning. When you see stuff, whether it's from a trusted friend or your worst enemy, read carefully. Yeah, well, this politician that I hate says this. Number one, you shouldn't hate your accursion. Number two, not everything they have to say is bad. You can't believe that. I do believe it. No, you cannot believe that. You can't. Read carefully. Engage with these things thoughtfully. Examine them critically. Accept them tentatively. And then, when they've passed, you may not feel as comfortable as you want to feel at that point, but you've got to make a decision to believe it fully. Somebody said it this way. Brother Brooke Suttle, he always talked about this. Brother Brooks so came into U.S. Cellular one day and he said, at one point, you got to drive the tent stakes in the ground. True. Yeah, well, at some point, you got to drive the tent stakes in the ground and know where you're at. How to think in a thinkless world. Guys, of all people, Christians should be the last ones believing everything they read or hear letting the ships come into customs and out of customs without any sort of guard whatsoever, Christians should be the last ones doing that. Oh, could you think Christians are so great? No, because I think our Savior is so wonderful. And I think the God that we believe in and we serve and we worship is the God of intellect, it, 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 of undiminished capacity through the, through the ages. He's the God of brilliance and order and truth. And as Christians, we need to be so entirely dedicated to the truth. Now, you say, Pastor, I noticed that you didn't apply any of these to the abortion argument or the LGBTQ stuff. All right, because I'm not trying to tackle one specific issue. I'm telling you how to engage with all of these issues. Steve? Mm. Yeah, that's right. So the reality, and again, it kind of closes the loop, and I'll, I'll, I'll stop with this, of course. It's back on what Cheryl said and what Steve said. One of the best ways to start that journey of getting wisdom, um, Matt Brackley will tell you this. He tells you this all the time. Just read a proverb a day. Literally would take about a minute, 30 seconds. Two, and you say, I'm a terribly slow reader. Congratulations, you've made it all the way up to five minutes. It takes me longer than that to sneeze sometimes, depending on how many spirits I have to. No, I'm just joking. All right, no. <laughs> but you made it all the way up to five minutes. Is five minutes worth wisdom? I'd say it is. I'd say it is. Just a good general rule. Um, think critically. Be on your guard. Again, we're not talking about being suspicious. We're just talking about being discerning. Because that really is a very biblical virtue. Does that make sense? All right, any questions before we wrap it up? And then Kev is going to come. And Now, his lesson is only going to be about two and a half hours. All right? So... <laughs>
You couldn't do it if you tried. Today, oh no, oh no, I picked the wrong day to challenge him on that. Uh, it will, it will behoove you, and you say, Pastor, I didn't want you to do that. I did, because for my sake, it will behoove you to know I did get a very large 18 inch clock with very readable numbers. Um, it's not there yet, <laughs> but now I know who's going to turn and look while I'm preaching, and I know what you look like when you do it. All right. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> I dig it. I'm going to put it right up there on the back, and uh, and it's going to be it's going to be for me, really for anything. Just so you know that I know what time it is, and uh, and it's going to be all right. You know what? If you're going to do it, just do it subtly, like I do in a long conversation after 13 yeps, two that's crazies, and four dangs, and they still won't stop talking. Just just do, watch your mouth. Just do, yeah, or just be like. Oh, now here's the worst part. My old Apple watches did not have an always on display. So you had to make it really obvious. Oh, I was just looking at a mole on my wrist. You know what I mean? Like now the always on display, you can just casually, Oh, now Siri's talking. Sorry, Siri. Anyways. All right. So that's going up. Um, so let's take about five, 10 minutes, talk to one another, love each other. And uh, please consider what I've said this morning. All right. All right. Love you. Yes.